Section 1 of Japanese Girls and Women. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Fraze. Japanese Girls and Women by Alice M. Bacon. Childhood, Part 1. To the Japanese baby, the beginning of life is not very different from its beginning in babies in the Western world. Its birth, whether it be girl or boy, is the cause of much rejoicing. As boys alone can carry on the family name and inherit titles and estates, they are considered of more importance, but many parents' hearts are made glad by the addition of a daughter to the family circle. As soon as the event takes place, a special messenger is dispatched to notify relatives and intimate friends while formal letters of announcement are sent to those less closely related. All persons thus notified must make an early visit to the newcomer in order to welcome it into the world, and must either take with them or send before them some present. Toys, pieces of cotton, silk, or crepe for the baby's dress are regarded as suitable, and everything must be accompanied by fish or eggs for good luck. Where eggs are sent, they are neatly arranged in a covered box, which may contain thirty, forty, or even one hundred eggs. Footnote. All presents in Japan must be wrapped in white paper, although, except for funerals, this paper must have some writing on it, and must be tied with a peculiar red and white paper string, in which is inserted the noshi, or bit of dried fish, daintily folded in a piece of colored paper, which is an indispensable accompaniment of every present. End of footnote. The baby, especially if it be the first one in the family, receives many presents in the first few weeks of its life, and at a certain time proper acknowledgment must be made and return presents sent. This is done when the baby is about thirty days old. Both baby and mother have a hard time of it for the first few weeks of its life. The baby is passed from hand to hand, fussed over, and talked to so much by the visitors that come in that it must think the world is a trying place. The mother, too, is denied the rest and quiet she needs, and wears herself out in the excitement of seeing her friends and the physical exercise of going through, so far as possible, the ceremonious bows and salutations that etiquette prescribes. Before the seventh day, the baby receives its name. Footnote. A child is rarely given the name of a living member of the family or of any friend. The father's name, slightly modified, is frequently given to a son, and those of ancestors long ago dead are sometimes used. One reason for this is probably the inconvenience of similar names in the same family, and middle names, as a way of avoiding this difficulty, are unknown. The father usually names the child, but some friend or patron of the family may be asked to do it. Names of beautiful objects in nature, such as plum, snow, sunshine, lotus, gold, are commonly used for girls, while boys of the lower classes often rejoice in such appellations as stone, bear, tiger, etc. To call a child after a person would not be considered any especial compliment. End of footnote. There is no especial ceremony connected with this, but the child's birth must be formally registered, together with its name at the district office of registration, and the household keep holiday in honor of the event. A certain kind of rice, cooked with red beans, a festival dish denoting good fortune, is usually partaken of by the family on the seventh day. The next important event in the baby's life is the Mia Mairi, a ceremony which corresponds roughly with our christening. On the thirtieth day after birth, the baby is taken for its first visit to the temple. Note, to speak with greater exactness, the Mia Mairi of a boy is on the thirty-first day of his life, of a girl on the thirty-third. End of note. For this visit, great preparations are made, and the baby is dressed in finest silk or crepe, gaily figured garments made especially for the occasion upon the dress appears in various places the crest of the family as on all ceremonial dresses whether for young or old for every japanese family has its crest thus arrayed and accompanied by members of the family the young babe is carried to one of the shinto temples and there placed under the protection of the patron deity of the temple this god chosen from a great number of shinto deities is supposed to become the special guardian of the child through life Offerings are made to the god and to the priest, and a blessing is obtained, and the baby is thus formally placed under the care of a special deity. 
this ceremony over there is usually an entertainment of some kind at the home of the parents especially if the family be one of high rank friends are invited and if there are any who have not as yet sent in presents they may give them at this time it is usually on this day that the families send to their friends some acknowledgment of the presents received this sometimes consists of the red bean rice such as is prepared for the seventh-day celebration and sometimes of cakes of mochi or rice paste a letter of thanks usually accompanies the return present if rice is sent it is put in a handsome lacquered box the box placed on a lacquered tray and the whole covered with a square of crepe or silk richly decorated the box the tray and the cover are of course returned and curious to say the box must be returned unwashed as it would be very unlucky to send it back clean a piece of japanese paper must be slipped into the box after its contents have been removed and box and tray must be given back just as they are to the messenger sometimes a box of eggs or a peculiar kind of dried fish called katsuobushi is sent with this present when it is desired to make an especially handsome return when as many as fifty or one hundred return presents of this kind are to be sent it is no slight tax on the mistress of the house to see that no one is forgotten and that all is properly done as special messengers are sent a number of men are sometimes kept busy for two or three days after all these festivities a quiet undisturbed life begins for the baby a life which is neither unpleasant nor unhealthful it is not jolted rocked or trotted to sleep it is allowed to cry if it chooses without anybody's supposing that the world will come to an end because of its crying and its dress is loose and easily put on so that very little time is spent in the tiresome process of dressing and undressing under these conditions the baby thrives and grows strong and fat learns to take life with some philosophy even at a very early age and is not subject to fits of hysterical or passionate crying brought on by much jolting or trotting or by the wearisome process of pinning buttoning tying of strings and thrusting of arms into tight sleeves the japanese baby's dress though not as pretty as that of our babies is in many ways much more sensible it consists of many wide-sleeved straight silk cotton or flannel garments as the season of the year may require all cut after nearly the same pattern and that pattern the same in shape as the grown-up kimono these garments are fitted one inside of the other before they are put on then they are laid down on the floor and the baby is laid into them a soft belt attached to the outer garments or dress is tied around the waist and the baby is dressed without a shriek or a wail as simply and easily as possible the baby's dresses like those of our babies are made long enough to cover the little bare feet and the sleeves cover the hands as well so preventing the unmerciful scratching that most babies give to their faces as well as keeping the hands warm and dry babies of the lower classes within a week after birth are carried about tied upon the back of some member of the family frequently an older sister or brother who is sometimes not more than five or six years old the poorer the family the earlier is the young baby thus put on someone's back and one frequently sees babies not more than a month old with bobbing heads and blinking eyes tied by long bands of cloth to the backs of older brothers or sisters and living in the streets in all weathers when it is cold the sister's haori or coat serves as an extra covering for the baby as well and when the sun is hot the sister's parasol keeps off its rays from the bobbing bald head living in public as the japanese babies do they soon acquire an intelligent interested look and seem to enjoy the games of the elder children upon whose backs they are carried as much as the players themselves babies of the middle classes do not live in public in this way but ride about upon the backs of their nurses until they are old enough to toddle by themselves and they are not so often seen in the streets as few but the poorest japanese even in the large cities are unable to have a pleasant bit of garden in which the children can play and take the air the children of the richest families the nobility and the imperial family are never carried about in this way the young child is born in the arms of an attendant within doors and without but as this requires the care of some one constantly and prevents the nurse from doing anything but care for the child only the richest can afford this luxury with the baby tied to her back a woman is able to care for a child and yet go on with her household labors and baby watches over mother's or nurse's shoulder between naps taken at all hours the process of drawing water washing and cooking rice and all the varied work of the house imperial babies are held in the arms of someone night and day from the moment of birth until they have learned to walk a custom which seems to render the lot of the high-born infant less comfortable in some ways than that of the plebeian child 
the flexibility of the knees which is required for comfort in the japanese method of sitting is gained in very early youth by the habit of setting a baby down with its knees bent under it instead of with its legs straight out before it as seems to us the natural way to the japanese the normal way for a baby to sit is with its knees bent under it and so at a very early age the muscles and tendons of the knees are accustomed to what seems to us a most unnatural and uncomfortable posture footnote that the position of the japanese in sitting is really unnatural and unhygienic is shown by recent measurements taken by the surgeons of the japanese army these measurements prove that the small stature of the japanese is largely due to the shortness of the lower limbs which are out of proportion to the rest of the body the sitting from early childhood upon the legs bent at the knee arrests the development of that part of the body and produces an actual deformity in the whole nation this deformity is less noticeable among the peasants who stand and walk so much as to secure proper development of the legs but among merchants literary men and others of sedentary habits it is plainly to be seen the introduction of chairs and tables as a necessary adjunct of japanese home life would doubtless in time alter the physique of the japanese as a people End of footnote. Among the lower classes, where there are few bathing facilities in the houses, babies of a few weeks old are often taken to the public bathhouse and put into the hot bath. These Japanese baths are usually heated to a temperature of a hundred to a hundred and twenty Fahrenheit, a temperature that most foreigners visiting Japan find almost unbearable. To a baby's delicate skin, the first bath or two is usually a severe trial but it soon becomes accustomed to the high temperature and takes its bath as it does everything else placidly and in public born into a country where cow's milk is never used the japanese baby is wholly dependent upon its mother for its milk and is not weaned entirely until it reaches the age of three or four years and is able to live upon the ordinary food of the class to which it belongs footnote sometimes in the old days rice water was given to babies instead of milk but it was nearly impossible to bring up a baby on this alone now both fresh and condensed milk are used where the mother's milk is insufficient but only in those parts of japan where the foreign influence is felt End of footnote. there is no intermediate stage of bread and milk oatmeal and milk gruel or pap of some kind for the all-important factor milk is absent from the bill of fare in a land where there is neither milk for babes nor strong meat for them that are full of age in consequence partly of the lack of proper nourishment after the child is too old to live wholly upon its mother's milk and partly perhaps because of the poor food that the mothers even of the higher classes live upon many babies in japan are afflicted with disagreeable skin troubles especially of the scalp and face troubles which usually disappear as soon as the child becomes accustomed to the regular food of the adult another consequence as i imagine of the lack of proper food at the teething period is the early loss of the child's first teeth which usually turn black and decay some time before the second teeth begin to show themselves with the exception of these two troubles japanese babies seem healthy hearty and happy to an extraordinary degree and show that most of the conditions of their lives are wholesome the constant out-of-door life and the healthful dress serve to make up in considerable measure for the poor food and the japanese baby though small after the manner of the race is usually plump and of firm hard flesh one striking characteristic of the japanese baby is that at a very early age it learns to cling like a kitten to the back of whoever carries it so that it is really difficult to drop it through carelessness for the baby looks out for its own safety like a young monkey the straps that tie it to the back are sufficient for safety but the baby from the age of one month is dependent upon its own exertions to secure a comfortable position and it soon learns to ride its bearer with considerable skill instead of being merely a bundle tied to the shoulders any one who has ever handled a japanese baby can testify to the amount of intelligence shown in this direction at a very early age and this clinging with arms and legs is perhaps a valuable part of the training which gives to the whole nation the peculiar quickness of motion and hardness of muscle that characterize them from childhood it is the agility and muscular quality that belong to wild animals that we see something of in the indian but to a more marked degree in the japanese especially of the lower classes the japanese baby's first lessons in walking are taken under favorable circumstances with feet comfortably shod in the soft tabby or mitten-like sock babies can tumble about as they like with no bump nor bruise upon the soft matted floors of the dwelling houses there is no furniture to fall against and nothing about the room to render falling a thing to be feared after learning the art of walking in the house the baby's first attempts out of doors are hampered by the zori or geta a light straw sandal or small wooden clog attached to the foot by a strap passing between the toes 
At the very beginning, the sandal or clog is tied to the baby's foot by bits of string fastened around the ankle, but this provision for security is soon discarded, and the baby patters along like the grown people, holding on the gaita by the strap passing between the toes. The somewhat cumbersome and inconvenient footgear must cause many falls at first, but baby's experience in the art of balancing upon people's backs now aids in this new art of balancing upon the little wooden clogs. Babies of two or three trot about quite comfortably in gaita that seem to give the most insecure footing, and older children run, jump, hop on one foot, and play all manner of active games upon heavy clogs that would wrench our ankles and toes out of all possibility of usefulness. This footgear, while producing an awkward, shuffling gait, has certain advantages over our own, especially for children whose feet are growing rapidly. The gaita, even if outgrown, can never cramp the toes nor compress the ankles. If the foot is too long for the clog, the heel laps over behind, but the toes do not suffer, and the use of the gaita strengthens the ankles by affording no artificial aid or support, and giving to all the muscles of the foot and leg free play, with the foot in a natural position. The toes of the Japanese retain their prehensile qualities to a surprising degree, and are used not only for grasping the footgear, but among mechanics almost like two supplementary hands, to aid in holding the thing worked upon. Each toe knows its work and does it, and they are not reduced to the dull uniformity of motion that characterizes the toes of a leather-shod nation. The distinction between the dress of the boy and the girl, that one notices from childhood, begins in babyhood. A very young baby wears red and yellow, but soon the boy is dressed in sober colors, blues, grays, greens, and browns, while the little girl still wears the most gorgeous of colors and the largest of patterns in her garments, red being the predominant hue. The sex, even of a young baby, may be distinguished by the color of its clothing. White, the garb of mourning in Japan, is never used for children, but the minutest babies are dressed in bright colored garments and of the same materials, wadded cotton, silk, or crepe, as those worn by adults of their social grade. As these dresses are not as easily washed as our own cambric and flannel baby clothes, there is a loss among the poorer classes in the matter of cleanliness, and the gorgeous soiled gowns are not as attractive as the more washable white garments in which our babies are dressed. For model clothing of a baby, I would suggest a combination of the Japanese style with the foreign, easily washed materials, a combination that I have seen used in their own families by Japanese ladies educated abroad, and one in which the objections to the Japanese style of dress are entirely obviated. The Japanese baby begins to practice the accomplishment of talking at a very early age, for its native language is singularly happy in easy expressions for children, and little babies will be heard chattering away in soft, easily spoken words long before they are able to venture alone from their perches on their mother's or nurse's backs. A few simple words express much, and cover all wants. Ia expresses discontent or dislike of any kind, and is also used for no. Mamma means food. Bebe is the dress, tata is the sock or house shoe, etc. We find many of the same sounds as in the baby language of English, with meanings totally different. The baby is not troubled with difficult grammatical changes, for the Japanese language has few inflections, and it is too young to be puzzled with the intricacies of the various expressions denoting different degrees of politeness, which are the snare and the despair of the foreigner studying Japanese. As our little girl emerges from babyhood, she finds the life opening before her a bright and happy one, but one hedged about closely by the proprieties, and one in which, from babyhood to old age, she must expect to be always under the control of one of the stronger sex. Her position will be an honorable and respected one only as she learns in her youth the lesson of cheerful obedience, of pleasing manners, and of personal cleanliness and neatness. Her duties must be always either within the house or, as she belongs to the peasant class, on the farm. There is no career or vocation open to her. She must be dependent always upon either father, husband, or son, and her greatest happiness is to be gained not by cultivation of the intellect, but by the early acquisition of the self-control which is expected of all Japanese women to an even greater degree than of the men. This self-control must consist not simply of the concealment of all the outward signs of any disagreeable emotion, whether grief, anger, or pain, but in the assumption of a cheerful smile and agreeable manner, even under the most distressing of circumstances. The duty of self-restraint is taught to the little girls of the family from the tenderest years. It is their great moral lesson, and is expatiated upon at all times by their elders. The little girl must sink herself entirely, must give up always to others, must never show emotions except such as will be pleasing to those about her. This is the secret of true politeness, and must be mastered if the woman wishes to be well thought of and to lead a happy life. The effect of this teaching is seen in the attractive but dignified manners of the Japanese women, and even of the very little girls. 
they are not forward nor pushing neither are they awkwardly bashful there is no self-consciousness neither is there any lack of savoir faire a childlike simplicity is united with a womanly consideration for the comfort of those around them a japanese child seems to be the product of a more perfect civilization than our own for it comes into the world with little of the savagery and barbarian bad manners that distinguish children in this country and the first ten or fifteen years of its life do not seem to be passed in one long struggle to acquire a coating of good manners that will help to render it less obnoxious in polite society how much of the politeness of the japanese is the result of training and how much is inherited from generations of civilized ancestors it is difficult to tell but my impression is that babies are born into the world with a good start in the matter of manners and that the uniformly gentle and courteous treatment that they receive from those about them together with the continual verbal teaching of the principle of self-restraint and thoughtfulness of others produce with very little difficulty the universally attractive manners of the people one curious thing in a Japanese household is to see the formalities that pass between brothers and sisters, and the respect paid to age by every member of the family. The grandfather and grandmother come first of all in everything. No one at table must be helped before them in any case. After them come the mother and father, and lastly, the children according to their ages. A younger sister must always wait for the elder to pay her due respect, even in the matter of walking into the room before her. The wishes and convenience of the elder, rather than the younger, are to be consulted in everything, and this lesson must be learned early by children. The difference in years may be slight, but the elder born has the first right in all cases. End of Childhood Part 1 Recording by Dan Fraze Of Japanese Girls and Women This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Fraze. Japanese Girls and Women by Alice M. Bacon. Childhood, Part 2. Our little girl's place in the family is a pleasant one. She is the pet and plaything of father and elder brothers, and she is never saluted by anyone in the family except her parents without the title of respect due her position. If she is the eldest daughter, to the servant she is Ojo-sama, literally, young lady. To her own brothers and sisters, Nesan, elder sister. Should she be one of the younger ones, her given name, preceded by the honorific O, and followed by San, meaning Miss, will be the name by which she will be called by younger brothers and sisters and by the servants. As she passes from babyhood to girlhood, and from girlhood to womanhood, she is the object of much love and care and solicitude, but she does not grow up irresponsible or untrained to meet the duties which womanhood will surely bring to her. She must learn all the duties that fall upon the wife and mother of a Japanese household, as well as obtain the instruction in books and mathematics that is coming to be more and more a necessity for the women of Japan. She must take a certain responsibility in the household, must see that tea is made for the guests who may be received by her parents, in all but the families of highest rank must serve it herself. Indeed, it is quite the custom of families of the higher classes should a guest whom it is desired to receive with a special honor dine at the house to serve the meal not with the family, but separately for the father and his visitor. And it is the duty of the wife or daughter, often the latter, to wait on them. This is in honor of the guest, not on account of the lack of servants, for there may be any number of them within call, or even in the back part of the room, ready to receive from the hands of the young girl what she has removed. She must, therefore, know the proper etiquette of the table, how to serve carefully and neatly, and, above all, have the skill to ply the sake bottle, so that the house may keep up its reputation for hospitality. Should guests arrive in the absence of her parents, she must receive and entertain them until the master or mistress of the house returns. She also feels a certain care about the behavior of the younger members of the family, especially in the absence of the parents. In these various ways she is trained for taking upon herself the cares of a household when the time comes. In all but the very wealthiest and most aristocratic families, the daughters of the house do a large part of the simple housework. In a house with no furniture, no carpets, no bric-a-brac, no mirrors, picture frames or glasses to be cared for, no stoves or furnaces, no windows to wash, a large part of the cooking to be done outside, and no latest styles to be imitated in clothing, the amount of work to be done by women is considerably diminished, but still there remains enough to take a good deal of time. Every morning there are the beds to be rolled up and stored away in the closet, the mosquito nets to be taken down, the rooms to be swept, dusted, and aired before breakfast. Besides this, there is the washing and polishing of the engawa, or piazza, which runs around the outside of a Japanese house between the shoji, or paper screens, that serve as windows. 
and the amado or sliding shutters that are closed only at night or during heavy driving rains breakfast is to be cooked and served dishes to be washed in cold water and then perhaps there is marketing to be done either at shops outside or from the vendors of fish and vegetables who bring their huge baskets of provisions to the door but after these duties are performed it is possible to sit down quietly to the day's work of sewing studying or whatever else may suit the taste or necessities of the housewife of sewing there is always a good deal to be done for many japanese dresses must be taken to pieces whenever they are washed and are turned dyed and made over and over again so long as there is a shred of the original material left to work upon there is washing too to be done although neither the hot water nor soap and in the place of ironing the cotton garments which are usually washed without ripping must be hung up on a bamboo pole passed through the armholes and pulled smooth and straight before they dry and the silk always ripped into breadths before washing must be smoothed while wet upon a board which is set in the sun until the silk is dry then there are the everyday dishes which our japanese maiden must learn to prepare the proper boiling of rice is in itself a study the construction of the various soups which form the staple in the japanese bill of fare the preparation of mochi a kind of rice dough which is prepared at the new year or to send to friends on various festival occasions these and many other branches of the culinary art must be mastered before the young girl is prepared to assume the cares of married life note twice after the mia mari of her babyhood does our little maid repair to the temple to seek the blessing of her patron god upon a step forward in her short life once when at the age of three the hair on her small head which until then has been shaved in fancy patterns is allowed to begin its growth toward the coiffure of womanhood and once when she has attained her seventh year and exchanges the soft narrow sash of infancy for the stiff wide obi which is the pride of every well-dressed japanese woman her little brother too though now no longer destined to wear the hammer-shaped queue of the old-time japanese warrior and whose fuzzy black head is now usually left unshaven in his babyhood still goes to the temple at the age of three to give thanks and when he comes to be five years old the little boy again goes up to the temple this time wearing for the first time the manly hakama or kilt-pleated trousers and makes offerings to the god who has protected him thus far the day set for these ceremonies is the fifteenth of november and there is no prettier sight in all of japan than a popular temple on that day all the streets that converge on the shrine are crowded with gaily dressed children hurrying along to make their offerings accompanied by parents brimming with pride and pleasure small feet are pattering wooden shoes clattering little hands clapping little tongues chattering three-year-old tots of both sexes trudging sturdily along in their clogs square little red-cheeked boys their black eyes shining with pride in their rustling new silk akama feeling that they are big boys and no longer to be confused with the babies that they were yesterday here too are the graceful seven-year-old maidens their many-coloured garments and their gorgeous new obi setting off to advantage their shining black hair and sparkling eyes the children are so many so happy and so impressed with the fun that it is to be older than they were and that the grown folks who accompany them seem like shadows the only real thing is the children within the temple precincts all the candy sellers and toy merchants who can find standing room for a stall are doing a brisk trade flags are flying drums are beating a kagura dance is going on in the pavilion about which stands a crowd of youngsters twittering like sparrows and the steps that lead to the temple itself are as thronged as jacob's ladder with little ones ascending and descending within the shrine the white-robed priests are hard at work from morning to night a little company forms in the vestibule goes to the priest in the first room where they bow and make their offerings and wait until there is space for them in the inner sanctuary from within comes the sound of a droning chant which ends at last and then a party that has finished its worship issues forth and those who have been waiting without go in and when the few minutes of worship are over and the amulet that rewards the due observance of the day has been received there are the dances to be seen and the omiyage to be purchased and at last the happy party returns feeling that one more milestone on the journey of life has been passed propitiously End of note but though the little girl's life is not without its duties and responsibilities it is also not at all lacking in simple and innocent pleasures first among the annual festivals and bringing with it much mirth and frolic comes the feast of the new year at this time father mother and all older members of the family lay aside their work and their dignity and join in the fun and sports that are characteristic of this season worries and anxieties are set aside with the close of the year and the first beams of the new year's sun bring in a season of unlimited joy for the children for about one week the festival lasts and the festal spirit remains through the whole month prompting to fun and amusements of all kinds from early morning until bedtime the children wear their prettiest clothes in which they play without rebuke guests come and go bringing congratulations to the family and often gifts for all 
the children's stock of toys is thus greatly increased and the house overflows with the good things of the season of which mochi or cake made from rice dough prepared always especially for this time is one of the most important articles the children are taken with their parents to meet new year's visits to their friends and to offer them congratulations and much they enjoy this as dressed in their best they ride from house to house in jinrikshas footnote jinriksha or kuruma a small light carriage usually with a broad top which is drawn by a man the jinriksha is the commonest of all vehicles now in japan jinriksha man and kurumaya are terms constantly used for the runner who draws the carriage and a footnote and then during the long happy evenings the whole family including even the grandfather and grandmother join in merry games the servants too are invited to join the family party and without seeming forward or out of place enter into the games with zest one of the favorite games is hyaku nin ishu literally the poems of a hundred poets it consists of two hundred cards on each of which is printed either the first or last half of one of the hundred famous japanese poems which give the name to the game the poems are well known to all Japanese, of whatever sort or condition. All Japanese poems are short, containing only thirty-one syllables, and have a natural division into two parts. The one hundred cards containing the latter halves of the poems are dealt and laid out in rows, face upward, before the players. One person is appointed reader. To him are given the remaining hundred cards, and he reads the beginnings of the poems in whatever order they come from the shuffled pack skill in the game consists in remembering quickly the line following the one read and rapidly finding the card on which it is written especially does the player watch his own cards and if he finds there the end of the poem the beginning of which has just been read he must pick it up before any one sees it and lay it aside if some one else buys the card first he seizes it and gives to the careless player several cards from his own hand whoever first disposes of all his cards is the winner the players usually arrange themselves in two lines drawn down the middle of the room, and the two sides play against each other, the game not being ended until either one side or the other has disposed of all its cards. The game requires great quickness of thought and of motion, and is invaluable in giving to all young people an education in the classical poetry of their own nation, as well as being a source of great merriment and jollity among the young and the old. Scattered throughout the year are various flower festivals, when often with her whole family our little girl visits the famous gardens where the plum the cherry the chrysanthemum the iris or the azalea attain their greatest loveliness and spends the day out of doors in aesthetic enjoyment of the beauties of nature supplemented by art and then there is the feast most loved in the whole year the feast of dolls when on the third day of the third month the great fireproof storehouse gives forth its treasures of dolls in an old family many of them hundreds of years old and for three days with all their belongings of tiny furnishings in silver lacquer and porcelain they reign supreme arranged on red covered shelves in the finest room of the house most prominent among the dolls are the effigies of the emperor and empress in antique court costume seated in dignified calm each on a lacquered dais near them are the figures of the five court musicians in their robes of office each with his instrument besides these dolls which are always present and form the central figures of the feast numerous others more plebeian but more lovable find places on the lower shelves and the array of dolls furnishings which is brought out on these occasions is something marvellous it was my privilege to be present at the feast of dolls in the house of one of the tokugawa daimyos a house in which the old forms and ceremonies were strictly observed and over which the wave of foreign innovation had passed so slightly that even the calendar still remained unchanged and the feast took place upon the third day of the third month of the old japanese year instead of on the third day of march which is the usual time for it now at this house where the dolls had been accumulating for hundreds of years five or six broad red cover shelves perhaps twenty feet long or more were completely filled with them and with their belongings the emperor and empress appeared again and again as well as the five court musicians and the tiny furnishings and utensils were wonderfully costly and beautiful before each emperor and empress was set an elegant lacquered table service trays bowls cups sake pots rice buckets etc all complete and in each utensil was placed the appropriate variety of food the sake used on this occasion is a sweet white liquor brewed especially for this feast as different from the ordinary sake as sweet cider is from the hard cider upon which a man may drink himself into a state of intoxication note the shiro sake white sake 
used for this occasion is a curious drink thick and white made from pounded rice and used especially for this feast some antiquarians believe that it is simply the earliest form of sake the national beverage which has been preserved in this ancient observance as the fly is preserved in amber End of note. besides the table service everything that an imperial doll can be expected to need or desire is placed upon the shelves lacquered norimono or palanquins lacquered bullocks carts drawn by bow-legged black bulls these were the conveyances of the great in old japan and these in minute reproductions are placed upon the red-covered shelves tiny silver and brass hibachi or fire-boxes are there with their accompanying tongs and charcoal baskets whole kitchens with everything required for cooking the finest japanese feasts as finely made as if for actual use all the necessary toilet apparatus combs mirrors utensils for blackening the teeth for shaving the eyebrows for reddening the lips and whitening the face all these things are there to delight the souls of the little girls who may have the opportunity to behold them for three days the imperial effigies are served sumptuously at each meal and the little girls of the family take pleasure in serving their imperial majesties but when the feast ends the dolls and their belongings are packed away in their boxes and lodged in the fireproof warehouses for another year the tokugawa collection of which i have spoken is remarkably full and costly for it has been making for hundreds of years in one of the younger branches of a family which for two and a half centuries was possessed of almost imperial power and lived in more than imperial luxury but there are few households so poor that they do not from year to year accumulate a little store of toys wherewith to celebrate the feast and whether the toys are many or few the feast is the event of the year in the lives of the little girls of japan Note, the keeping of a feast on the third day of the third month is a custom that has come down from very ancient times at first the day was set apart for the purification of the people and a part of the ceremony was the rubbing of the body with bits of white paper roughly cut into the semblance of a white-robed priest these paper dolls were believed to take away the sins of the year when they had been used for purification they were inscribed with the sex and birth year of the user and thrown into the river the third month was also in early times the season for cock-fighting among the men and for doll-playing among the women the special name by which the dolls of the doll festival are called is ohina sama the hina in modern japanese means a chicken or other young bird and is never used to mean anything else except the dolls thus the dolls are shown to be associated with the ancient cock-fighting an amusement which has now almost gone out except in the province of tosa on the island of shikoku the oldest dolls did not represent the emperor and empress but simply a man and a woman and were modelled closely after the old white paper dolls of the religious ceremony when the tokugawa shoguns had firmly established their splendid court at Iedo, a decree was issued designating the five feast days upon which the daimyos were to present themselves at the shogun's palace and offer their congratulations one of the days thus appointed was the third day of the third month it is believed that the giving of the chief place at the feast to effigies of the emperor and empress was a part of the policy of the shogunate a policy which aimed to keep alive the spirit of loyalty to the throne while at the same time the occupant of the throne remained a puppet in the hands of his vicegerent each girl born into a family has a pair of ohina sama placed for her upon the red covered shelf on the first feast of dolls that comes after her birth when as a bride she goes to her husband's house she carries the dolls with her and the first feast after her marriage she observes with special ceremonies until she has a daughter old enough to carry out the observance she must keep up the ceremony the feast as it exists to-day is said by the japanese to serve three purposes it makes the children of both sexes loyal to the imperial family it interests the girls in housekeeping and it trains them in ceremonial etiquette End of note. beside the regular feasts at stated seasons our little girl has a great variety of toys and games some belonging to particular seasons some played at any time during the year at the new year the popular out-of-door games are battledore and shuttlecock and ball there is no prettier sight to my mind than a group of girls in their many-coloured wide-sleeved dresses playing with battledore or ball the graceful rhythmic motion of their bodies the bright upturned eyes the laughing faces are set off to perfection by the colouring of their flowing drapery and their agility on their high lacquered clogs is a constant source of wonder and admiration to any one who has ever made an effort to walk upon the clumsy things there are dolls too that are not relegated to the storehouse when the feast of dolls has ended but who are the joy and comfort of their little mothers during the whole year and at every kwan koba or bazaar an endless variety of games puzzles pictures to be cut out and glued together and amusements of all kinds may be purchased at extremely low rates 
there is no dearth of games for our little girl and many pleasant hours are spent in the household sitting-rooms with games or conundrums or stories or the simple girlish chatter that elicits constant laughter from sheer youthful merriment as for fairy tales so dear to the hearts of children in every country the daphne's child has her full share often she listens half asleep while cuddling under the warm quilted cover of the kotats footnote kotats a charcoal fire in a brazier or a small fireplace in the floor over which a wooden frame is set and the whole covered by a quilt the family sit about it in cold weather with a quilt drawn up over the feet and knees and a footnote in the cold winter evenings to the drowsy voice of the grandmother or nurse who carries her away on the wings of imagination to the wonderful palace of the sea gods or to the haunts of the terrible oni monsters with red distorted faces and fearful horns momotaro the peach boy with his wonderful feats in the conquest of the oni is her hero until he is supplanted by the more real ones of japanese history there are occasional all-day visits to the theatre too where seated on the floor in a box railed off from those adjoining our little girl in company with her mother and sisters enjoys though with paroxysms of horror and fear the heroic historical plays which are now almost all that is left of the heroic old japan here she catches the spirit of passionate loyalty that belonged to those days forms her ideals of what a noble japanese woman should be willing to do for parents or husband and comes away taught as she could be by no other teaching what the spirit was that animated her ancestors what spirit must animate her should she wish to be a worthy descendant of the women of old among these surroundings with these duties and amusements our little girl grows to womanhood the unconscious and beautiful spirit of her childhood is not driven away at the dawn of womanhood by thoughts of beaux of coming out in society of a brief career of flirtation and conquest and at the end as fine a marriage either for love or money as her imagination can picture she takes no thought for these things herself and her intercourse with young men though free and unconstrained has about it no grain of flirtation or romantic interest when the time comes for her to marry her father will have her meet some eligible young man and both she and the young man will know when they are brought together what is the end in view and will make up their minds about the matter but until that time comes the modest japanese maiden carries on no flirtations thinks little of men except as higher beings to be deferred to and waited on and preserves the childlike innocence of manner combined with a serene dignity under all circumstances that is so noticeable a trait in the japanese woman from childhood to old age the japanese woman is under this discipline a finished product at the age of sixteen or eighteen she is pure sweet and amiable with great power of self-control and a knowledge of what to do upon all occasions the higher part of her nature is little developed no great religious truths have lifted her soul above the world into a clearer and higher atmosphere but as far as she goes in regard to all the little things of daily life she is bright industrious sweet-tempered and attractive and prepared to do well her duty when that duty comes to her as wife and mother and mistress of a household the highest principle on which she is taught to act is obedience even to the point of violating all her finest feminine instincts at the command of father or husband and acting under that principle she is capable of an entire self-abnegation such as few women of any race can achieve with the close of her childhood the happiest period in the life of a japanese woman closes the discipline that she has received so far repressive and constant as it has often been has been from kind and loving parents she has freedom to a certain degree such as is unknown to any other country in asia in the home she is truly loved often the pet and plaything of the household though not receiving the caresses and words of endearment that children in america expect as a right for love in japan is undemonstrative footnote kisses are unknown and regarded by conservative japanese as an animal and disgusting way of expressing affection End of footnote. but just at the time when her mind broadens and the desire for knowledge and self-improvement develops the restraints and checks upon her become more severe her sphere seems to grow narrower difficulties one by one increase and the young girl who sees life before her as something broad and expansive who looks to the future with expectant joy may become in a few years the weary disheartened woman end of childhood part two recording by dan phrase